Hello, I'm Michael Bott. And I'm Rupert Soskin. Welcome to another Prehistory Guys interview, talking with people making a difference in the world of archaeology and prehistory. And today we're really delighted to be talking with Amanda Hart, director of the Corinium Museum in Sirencester. Now, despite any number of challenges over the past six years, including more recently the COVID lockdowns, of course, Amanda has kept driving the project of giving the museum a complete overhaul and redesign and with her team has created a breathtaking set of galleries that cover the full span of human history in the Cotswolds. One thing that makes Amanda so rare is that she's a museum director with archaeology in her veins. She studied archaeology at university and has been involved on excavations of the Bronze Age sites in the Moroni Valley on Cyprus. And ultimately she turned this back to her love of museums, bringing a unique slant on how archaeology could be presented to the public. We think that what Amanda has achieved at Corinium is nothing short of extraordinary, and this interview is our way of helping celebrate her dedication and devotion in bringing prehistory to a wider audience. We hope you enjoy our conversation as much as we did. Amanda Hart, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to the show. And how the devil are you? Apart from all the nonsenses, you've actually moved house <laughs> while all this has been going on as well, haven't you? Oh, I, I did. It's been just a, a whirlwind few years for me, um, particularly the last two to three years when I've been working on the Stone Age to Quinium project, the, the build side of the project and developing the new galleries. Um, and last year, in the middle of all of that, I decided to move house. <laughs> <laughs> so I moved to um, a lovely little place um, in the Cotswolds called Nailsworth. And um, Nailsworth is quite, it, it's, a, it's a quirky place is the, the best way I can describe it. Um, but my, my journey to work now involves going up over Minch and Hampton Common and I frequently get stopped by the cows that are on the common <laughs> land. So they just wander across the road. Yeah, um, rush hour in I the Cotswolds. Do, you know, yeah. yeah, in the Cotswolds. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I do love wildlife and Nailsworth is um, in a valley and our hill sits at the top of the valley. So we, we overlook um, the, the valley from the back of our house and you know, it's it's just delightful. I just lovely, switch off lovely. when I see that. Well, an extraordinary Fantastic. achievement, uh, moving house while this is all still uh, going on, but an extraordinary achievement over the past six years. I just thought you might like an opportunity, mm. uh, Amanda. I mean, it's not just you, although I do get the whiff of extraordinary late leadership going on here as far as getting this complete is concerned. But you might like an opportunity mm -hmm. to acknowledge, uh, you know, the people that have worked with you uh, on on this and uh, and creating um, this extraordinary new, well, it's almost virtually a new museum, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, yeah, it really is. Um, oh my goodness, I mean, there's such a long list of, of people involved in this project. Um, I mean, I would have to start with the, the immediate museum team um, because, you know, none of this would have happened without the strong team that, that um, we have here at Crinium Museum um, for their expertise and, and their professionalism. Um, but in particular, I would say um, Dr. Alison Brooks, who heads up the collections team, um, she's been invaluable in terms of um, the interpretation scheme and looking at, at the objects and choosing those um, with me. Um, so we very much worked on that together um, and all of her staff beneath her have been involved in, in selecting objects from the archive, doing a lot of the research, all of that kind of thing. I and mean, we, we did our own interpretation for this. So we've written all the information that you read in the galleries itself. So, I mean, it has been an immense piece of work putting those together. Um, also, I give special mention to uh, Emma Stewart, who um, has headed up the activity plan. Um, so because this project is National Lo Lottery Heritage funded, um, there are two aspects to it. It's not just about um, the build itself and, and the new galleries, 
Um, that's the, the, the heritage element, if you like. Um, but it's also about people and communities and how we are going to benefit people and communities through this project. So we have to be able to demonstrate that. Um, so the way that we've done that is look at um, how we're going to engage our audiences. And Emma um, wrote all of that plan and, and has been instrumental in, in delivering a lot of that work. So her and, and her team um, in the education side, exhibition side, um, you name it, they've all contributed to that. So um, I would say that's the sort of the, the key museum team involved in, in the project. But on top of that, um, you know, we're very fortunate here in the Cotswolds, we have uh, a number of um, high profile academics that have been excavating in the area as well. Um, so to name a few, Dr. Tom Moore, Tim Darville, um, and just down the road from us is Cotswold Archaeology. Um, we have a really strong partnership with them. So um, I'd say Neil Holbrook, Martin Watts, who heads up Cotswold Archaeology at Kemble. Um, it's been great talking to all of these people as well in, in putting um, the, the galleries together, talking to them about how they might look as well. Um, also the whole project team in terms of exhibition design, um, the, the build works, you know, building, and that's the engineering side, mechanical engineering, the, the lighting, um, you know, you, you name it in, in that sense as well. And the architects have done a fantastic job. So yes, there's lots of people I could go on and on. And uh, just before we come on to asking you about yourself and your own involvement, you know, and what, what's been going, are there any particular sort of highs and lows, pushbacks you, you know, that have occurred for you? I know mean, not least of which, of course, is the pandemic. It's really difficult. Um, I think because it's, again, because it's her heritage funded, you go through this process where it's two phases. The first phase, which took three years in itself, was what's called the development phase. And you have to put forward your ideas, but in that you have to write a 10 year business plan, interpretation plan, the activity plan. And you have to go through all of that. They give you a, a small amount of money to invest at that point to work out your ideas with audiences, et cetera, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. But at the end of that three year period, before you've even started, building works or anything, at that point, they could say no. And that's been three years worth of, of work yes. to get oh, to that my goodness. stage. Oh, and goodness lots of projects fall down at that point. Yeah. And it's devastating right. for people that have invested in that time. Um, so that was an anxious moment. Thankfully, we, we did get through to the, the next phase. And that's when they give you then all the funding to actually go ahead yeah. and, and do the project. Yeah. I think the next biggest hurdle for me was when building work started. Um, because of the nature of the building, it's a grade two um, listed building. Um, <laughs> you know, there's uh, yeah. four buildings that join together to make up Carinia Museum. And in the architectural plans, I wanted to remove a corner of one of those buildings. So um, the corner is actually was in our main reception in order for that to to come out we were quite limited in what investigation work we could do because it would have meant digging up in the middle of our reception area so we could only do a small amount of investigative work when we did that amount of work um we we knew that the ground wasn't great but we came up with two schemes structural schemes so that um you know, if there were two different eventualities, we could go with one of those schemes. In the end, when they started to excavate to actually take out the corner of that building, it was the worst case scenario. Um, they discovered that the building was almost sitting on a, on a river, basically. Oh um, and they were amazed at how the building was still standing. Still standing. So, <laughs> yeah, they really, they really were. They were saying, do you know what? You, you absolutely need to do this work now, <laughs> whether you like it yeah. or not. You need to do this work. <laughs> but, um, but at that point, of course, 
they said, right, we can't, because of the nature of this, we have to go three meters down. We have to pile, we have to do it by hand because it's the building above is three stories high with a strong room at the top of the museum. So extremely dangerous. And they said, this is gonna be an expensive job. They came back and it, it added something like 250 to 300,000 pounds more onto the project. <laughs> and oh, goodness. You know, I've done a lot of the fundraising for the project myself. And at that point, having to go back, talk to key stakeholders and get their further investment was a really stressful time for me. That was particularly mm, difficult. Sure. I'm so um, glad that we have an opportunity to, you know, for people to understand the size, you know, of the task that uh, you yeah. uh, took on and the roller coaster experience yeah. that must have been. But now, Rupert. Yes. You well, kick uh, off yeah, I want to, to know. Next... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, the yeah. thing is, th th there is so much to talk about in in what you've actually achieved at the museum. But before we get into that, I want to ask you. We always ask everybody, yep. what on earth was it that got you involved in archaeology in the first place, and ultimately brought you to be the director of a museum, for God's sake? Um, because right. you have uh, you, you've excavated in in Cyprus as well, haven't you? You know, archaeology was a thing f uh, before you really got into the museum side. So yeah, tell us about that. Yeah. What got you where you are? All oh, right. <laughs> well, I'm I'm going to deviate slightly. Uh, it might be a first for the prehistory guys, but because I think there's there's <laughs> there's two strands to to my passion. One's archaeology, and the other is museums. And when I okay. looked back on, on my life and how I got into this, I think the two regularly cross over and, and you know, come up. So um, I think from a museum perspective, um, I think everybody remembers their first visit to a, a museum. And um, mine was when I was um, really little. I was still in, in, in primary school and I grew up in Australia. So it was in Australia and I remember going to the Melbourne Museum and seeing Farlap, the racehorse, which was oh. famous because this racehorse won um, the Gold Cup in Melbourne several times and it became this, this big thing in, in Melbourne. And it's, if you go to the Melbourne Museum and, and look at what's in there, there's not a... <laughs> It's not a great deal, but I remember seeing this huge racehorse and being absolutely amazed, you know, the size of it and what, what, what was this thing? What was this object and why was it important? And I think that was my first experience, really, of the ability of museums to really infuse and inspire and, and you know, uh, make you ask questions about objects. So that was my first museum experience. And because I grew up in Australia, um, I, didn't, I didn't really encounter much archaeology until um, I moved mm. to, to Britain. And, um, and then I remember in school learning about European prehistory. And it was when mm. Stone Age was on the curriculum. And I remember you know, learning about Stone Age people hunter gatherers and I was absolutely fascinated, really fascinated. Yeah. So um, that sort of got me on the archeology span trajectory, but I have to say, you know, my parents are, are both really into archeology. span um, my, my dad's an archdeacon. Um, mm. So I spent a lot of my childhood going to ecclesiastical um, buildings, abbeys, churches, and because my dad was was based at a lot of um, medieval churches, there were a lot of excavations actually. <laughs> so he would take me along yes. um, and show me what was happening as well. Um, right. So that was, um, you know, quite an important thing in my childhood. And because we moved from Australia, um, initially it was for a, a, a sabbatical for my father, um, and initially it was for three years. So in that those three years, we travelled. All over Europe and visited so many museums and sites um, and I just became more and more interested in in archaeology as a subject. 
And how, uh, how, how did you come to be where you are at, uh, at the Corinian Museum? Um, so after um, I studied ancient history and then, uh, and then I, I, I went on to study archaeology at university at Reading. And at the time um, I was interested in European prehistory and I was fortunate enough there are only six of us um, that were able to go on this excavation in, in Cyprus. Um, mm -hmm. So I went out in my first year. It was a Bronze Age site in the Moroni Valley. Um, and we were excavating a, a Bronze Age house, which was stunning. You think about Bronze Age buildings in, in Britain and <laughs> compare it to those in Cyprus. I mean, these had mm, mm, pebble mosaic mm. floors. They were <laughs> something else. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, I just remember just the feeling being on excavation and, and finding things. You know, I, I found um, a rubbish tip that was <laughs> full of oil lamps, but the most exquisite oil lamps. Um, so I, that was it. I was, I, I, I got the bug and, but I became more interested in artifacts i mean i think i discovered when i was in cyprus because i went back for another season and um i think i knew then i wasn't going to be a site archaeologist because it was <laughs> it was just grueling really yes. i mean long day i mean hats off to all archaeologists that work on, on say, digs yes. because Absolutely. it is hard work hats off to all archaeologists yes <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. See, see, it's, it's so thought. true. So it's, it's something we, we've, we've commented so many times about the Far amount too. of uh, after the event work, you know, with people wading through God knows how many thousand pieces of flint that all need to be catalogued <laughs> and everything else. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Field archaeologists are uh, <laughs> <they're> <laughs> we, special. Field archaeologists, <laughs> we salute you. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we do. Um, because I just uh, thought I just, mm. I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't make a living out of this. But I, I became more interested in the objects themselves and yeah. what objects can tell us mm. um, about, well, so many things. <laughs> um, yeah. And so I decided that I was going to go down the route of um, working in a museum. And so I, um, I, I, I did a lot of voluntary work in museums and, and then I did my um, MA in museum studies at Leicester. Um, but I, I never strayed from archaeology, so I specialised in archaeological curatorship. But doing a museum studies course, it's you know it's so practical that it taught me all the the different aspects of museology and working in museums because there's so many different facets to working in a museum, and I guess all of that yeah. is what makes a good exhibition because. Yeah. all of those elements go into a, a good exhibition it's not just about the objects it's about so many other things as well mm -hmm. yeah and why particularly yeah. siren sister what what how uh, how did you come to be particularly at siren sister um well i just finished my studies and i was still working at reading university and um i was really just looking for um museum jobs but i knew that I, I wanted to work in an archaeological museum. Mm. And there's not that many in the country. No. <laughs> the choices are limited. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No. So it was the first um, museum job that I applied for. And um, mm. I, mm. I, I got the job. And Amazing. I, I actually came yeah. to Corinium to, to work um, as the, the head of education. To, to run that department. Oh, okay. Um, right. Interesting. Right. Yeah, which I did for ten years, and and then at that point, I mean, I was I was looking for other jobs, um, but I, I'd already decided then that I wanted to get back into collection side of things, and then the job came available here, and I went for it, and and here I still am. <laughs> but and, I decided to at history. that point yeah. I want to do a project. So yeah. hence I started the, the project. 
Well, that's a perfect segue into the next question because, <laughs> you know, clawing back a, a bit now, then, you know, the, the thing, the question comes up, why the last six years? You know, what were the particular problems that needed to be uh, addressed at the museum that kick-started mm -hmm. uh, this um, project into activity? Um, well, I think museums have gone through quite a, a, a difficult period, really, with, with lots of challenges. Um, we are a local authority museum, and, um, you know, all our funding initially came through the local authority. And, of course, at that point, government grants had been reducing, so a lot of what they call sort of discretionary services were being looked at. And... Um, Certainly at that time, a number of museums were looking at alternatives. Um, sorry, a number of councils were looking at alternative ways of delivering their museum services. Um, yeah. So a number went out to um, trusts. They set up their own charitable trusts. Um, and others, uh, like us, um, we were actually put out on a contract so we're currently yeah. on a on a contract. Um, okay. right. So there were lots of different management models being being looked at, um, but with the sort of the, the decreasing um, investment, if you like, um, you know that came with reducing staff numbers, which then mm -hmm. came with reducing our resources, and and museums really were being asked to look at. Um, their income streams. You know, you can't rely yeah. on government funding anymore. So how are you going to become viable um, and sustainable as, as a museum? So we needed to consider um, our assets, if you like, and look at, um, you know, the building itself and what we could do with the building. And we also need mm -hmm. to consider our programming. It just, it wasn't enough anymore for museums to just open their doors and expect people to come you know Understood. you just couldn't yeah. do that so so what were we going to do to um get people into the museum mm -hmm. so that's really was the starting point for the project and there are a number of things mm. that i'd observed within the museum um myself that i thought oh you know one day if i get the opportunity I will change this because it doesn't, it's not working. <laughs> yeah. um, so, I mean, one of the things we, we have a, um, what we call our lifelong learning center, a catchy title, <laughs> but um, it's a, a space that can be used for all sorts of activity. So it can be a lecture theater, um, but it has retractable seating. So then it can convert into a workspace area. Mm. Um, and some of the new income streams with our, um, our programming that we'd tested out were things like running a cinema here in the museum, okay. which actually yeah. really mm -hmm. took off. <laughs> Goodness, yeah. And yeah. it was becoming, oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, it became a really good income stream. So we thought, okay, so c cinema works. Let's try live screenings of national theatre and opera. And oh, oh, cool. Anyway, cool, cool. People couldn't get enough of these. So we were doing <laughs> more things like that in yeah. that space. But also, um, corporate hire became a, a really important income stream for us. So we would have, um, you know, companies, local companies use our space um, to do their events. And then mm -hmm. we found ourselves in this impossible position where we had this amazing space and we were turning away corporate hires because okay. schools took priority in that space. You know, that's one uh -huh. of our mm -hmm. sort of targets that we have to meet. Um, so it was really frustrating to think we could be getting all this income and yet we don't, we don't have the space to accommodate all these different things happening right. in the museum. Uh, yeah. So certainly one of the central things in the project was to create a space um, that could be used for all sorts of other things, the school workshops, but demonstrations, 
work that volunteers mm. do, all of that could happen in this this new space that would be at the heart yeah. of the museum, and the other space would be free. So that's just one example. Yeah, was was there a kind of a, a tipping point that um, where there was no turning back? You know, a, a, a sort of a, a launching point, an event that happened, or something that came off. You know, at what point was the decision made to to go forth? <laughs> <laughs> I think once I set my mind to something, <laughs> I'm a start a finisher. <laughs> And I'm determined. And um, once I'd set off on that journey, yeah, that was it. I was doing it. I was doing okay. it. Okay. But it's a really okay. uh, right at that uh, at the start. <laughs> it's a really difficult thing because, in order to get the investment you need from somebody like the the National Lottery Heritage Fund, yeah, you have to have already had significant investment from elsewhere. But I a see, lot of yeah. other funders mm. wouldn't invest until they got the heritage fund money. So it was like a that chicken one. and egg right. scenario. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so that that was quite difficult, that first stage. Well, but once I got the first... Hats off to you because, yeah, hats off to you because, <laughs> you know, the, it, it is quite extraordinary, you know, to jump through these hurdles, to get through these hurdles and have the strength and passion to uh, make sure these things happen. Um, yeah. The Corinium Museum, this is kind of the clues in, in the name a bit, and previously uh, mm. the, and, and it still is, uh, Sirencester is a Roman town and uh, the museum uh, is very much focused uh, on the Roman occupation and what they left behind. But what of yeah. course, attracted, you know, uh, um, brought us to you was that we found out that you were shifting the focus just a little bit to include more about the prehistory of, uh, of the Cotswolds. That wasn't to say that there wasn't a prehistory element before, but you mm. have determined to bring it far more uh, into, into focus. So um, what, from your point of view, was the, the, the big thing, you know, it's just, just your own personal passion about that, or was there something more that had you uh, bring the emphasis more around towards prehistory uh, and the development of the, the fantastic, uh, as far as I've seen from the film, the uh, exhibition itself, the interpretation itself? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's just in you saying it there, that I realised that actually <laughs> there's definitely some of me in that and that actually, yes, my passion about prehistory is probably why I chose those galleries. <laughs> However, Good. it's not the only reason. <laughs> um, I mean, when we've gone through various stages of development with this museum over the years and the last major development was um, in 2002 to 2004 um, mm -hmm. And in that development, um, the whole Roman section um, was doubled in size. The mezzanine level was put on. We added in a Saxon gallery at that time, revamped medieval, um, and then uh, went through to the 19th century. So all of those sections were really looked at in that phase of development, which took two years. And that was a seven million pound project so it you know that was extensive um so i was really looking at areas that needed development at the time and the prehistory galleries um oh i don't want to say dire that's a bit harsh but they, <laughs> they were old and tired <laughs> and they <Yeah>. really <laughs> um they need they needed looking at and they the interpretation hadn't really been looked at for well at that point 25 years so so now we're talking oh 30 years plus um mm -hmm. and of course you know as a, a museum the thing that people have to realize is that we are constantly collecting so over a period of 25 to 30 years you can imagine well maybe you can't but we have amassed a huge amount of, <laughs> of archaeology, um, yeah, you know, yeah. with boxes, boxes of archaeology. Um, 
and certainly in the areas of prehistory because they weren't done as part of the other galleries we we had a lot of material in storage that we we needed to review and we needed to get it out on display and it just seemed the obvious mm. thing that the the prehistory were looked at because uh, <laughs> you you are the depository museum for the whole of the Cotswolds aren't you we are we are we are now we all, we haven't always been um but since i think 1976 <laughs> we have collected for the entire Cotswold district that's just huge <laughs> <laughs> yes i think the Cotswolds is the largest rural district in england um, so it is it is huge, but also it's archaeologically rich. Mm. It's a rich landscape. Yeah. So we have, you know, we have a lot of archaeology, but we have some really important archaeology as well, and some important mm. stories to tell from mm. that. Which particular site, which uh, particular excavations have you focused on in the museum, in the prehistory part of the museum? Um, so in the the older prehistory galleries that we had, um, some of that archaeology is obviously incorporated into the new galleries. Mm. Um, so uh, I'm just trying to think. So Hazelton North is yep. a, a, mm -hmm. a long barrow, mm -hmm. yep. um, Neolithic, Cotswold Seven type cairn um, that was chosen for full excavation between 1979 and, and uh, 82. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason it was selected for excavation is because a committee had been formed sometime in the 70s looking at the risk of, of these Cotswold Seven Barrows because they were being um, destroyed, if you like, by, by ploughing and um, yeah. it was becoming an increasing issue. Course, so this committee yeah, yeah. was formed to look at this and they excavated um, Hazelton Longbarrow and um, uh, all, all the, the the contents of it. So it's it's around forty one individuals from oh that my goodness. barrow. Wow! Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and that's, around... that that competes well with uh, yeah some more well known ones, doesn't it? Goodness. <laughs> yes. Mm. Yeah, and it's I mean it's a really well known famous Longbarrow. It, it appears on Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> <laughs> that's the one yeah yes yeah we were racking so our Indiana brains James earlier because we talked about it <laughs> <laughs> oh that's um, one yeah, okay grief. but the the so there, there were two chambers to this long barrow uh north and south and um mm -hmm. we have the complete south chamber reconstructed in the Carinium Museum. Oh, fantastic. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, so you can yeah, actually, it extraordinary, um, actually... It's extraordinary, but that was already in those galleries. It was put in there yeah. in, in um, the 80s. Yeah. Um, but it was in the wrong place. So as part of <laughs> okay. the project, we had to move this south chamber into another location so we could put the cases in. Um, yeah. So we we had sp specialist conservators, Clevedon Conservation, who were brilliant, yeah. um, and they single-handedly had to remove first of all the smaller stones on the outside, and then all the massive orthostats, um, and they had to be moved into the the new location. And um, the the base of this uh, chamber um, was actually structurally engineered. And there was a joke on okay. site that you could launch a rocket off it because, <laughs> <laughs> because it, had, it had to take the weight of this chamber, which is huge weight. So we have the, the Hazelton archive, which is, um, is really important because in terms of scientific analysis, all of those individuals, um, because it, it sort of demonstrates a, a Neolithic community. They have mm. um, been analysed quite a lot <laughs> by researchers. So we have quite a lot of information um, about uh, the ske skeletal remains from this site. Yeah, yeah. You've also got a representation of a beaker burial. Is that right, Amanda? 
Yes, two other important sites to mention um, mm -hmm. that again have been excavated in the last sort of 15 years. Um, Kings Hill North, so that's All just right, outside yeah. of Direncester. Um, and that site sort of runs from the Neolithic period um, right the way through to Roman. Yeah. Um, so we have quite a lot of um, objects to come out of, of Kings Hill North, um, mm -hmm. including um, beaker burials. Yeah. And the one yeah. that we have on display in the new galleries is a reconstructed burial of um, a, a female. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's in the usual position on her side um, in a flex position uh, with a beaker at her, her feet. Um, this is a really unusual burial uh, because it's what's called a, a hooves and hide burial. And basically, cow hide was placed. They're incredibly rare. Okay. Oh, goodness. And yes. Yeah. And, and so it has the hide of a cow over the top of her. Um, Does that have another name? Because that was um, that was similar to the uh, the lech laid um, uh, burial, wasn't it? There was a there was a cow hide burial. There. I think there was. There, yes. There are others. There's one in yeah. I think Boughton Business Park. Okay. Um, and also you get them in Wessex. Right. So that's the other place. Right. Yeah. So it's clearly mm. a, I mean it's indicates a high status female. Um, mm. But she, the others are male, so she is the only example of a female hide and hooves burial. Okay. So yeah. right. it's no, quite, yeah. yeah. Def definitely that was, you're absolutely right, Rupert, uh, the, the lech laid, uh, yeah, the uh, shaman under the cape, yeah. uh, under the skate park fellow. <laughs> interesting and and so not not so very far away in fact really no uh, that's interesting in itself because yes the, the um because the the beaker is pretty much complete isn't it in that uh, uh I, I mean i know it's been completely reconstructed but uh, <laughs> but it, it's almost intact in, in, in complete isn't yes. it entire i mean yeah i mean we we used um one of the best in the country a conservator called lynn edge she was absolutely fantastic i mean we s sent these beakers out to her and they were in fragments. They were in bags, fragments. And she'd done an incredible job, incredible. And so we, you know, we, we, we now have quite a number of, of beakers on display. Um, but there was one beaker from Kings Hill North that I just thought was too fragmentary for her to piece back yeah. together, but she did it. It's incredible. So really, really lovely it, items. It is. All these unsung heroes behind the scenes, all these uh, incredible craftspeople behind the scenes, uh, yeah, yes. making these things possible, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Well, it is, that's uh, another aspect, isn't it? When you were um, uh, making all the new displays in the museum, you, you've actually made films with a lot of uh, highly skilled uh, uh, creators, haven't you? Uh, yeah. The, the likes of um, of, uh, of James uh, Dilley and uh, and people. Uh, yeah, tell yeah. us a little yeah. bit about that. Tom, that's Tom, quite a bit of Tom work Tim Brower. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yes. we know Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I know I've li listened to to your shows before, and the numbers of people that were mentioned, I thought, oh, we've used them in the galleries. <laughs> <It's great. laughs> but they are they they're the leading experts in their field at what they do, and we've yeah. we've managed to use them. But we've got different interpretive strands going through the galleries, and one of these is technologies and the change. Yeah. It's an obvious one mm -hmm. in prehistory, but the change in technology as you go through the different ages. And so yeah. we begin in the, the, the Paleolithic period, talking about hand axes and flint napping as the very first, you know, stone tools. Um, so James Dilley, is in a film and, and he, he shows his techniques of making a, a hand axe. 
And then we go through um, with the introduction of pottery in the Neolithic. And we've got, of course, Brain Taylor, um, who produces a grooved ware pot. Um, and then we've got Neil Burridge, and he does a um, Bronze Age Pulse Day Vax. And then we go through uh, to Tom Timbrell, who does a, an Iron Age knife. And then the last video is the um, Ermine Street Guard talking about the Roman cavalry and the arrival of the cavalry. So we've got these films. They're really lovely, actually. Um, but they just put the objects into context. Yeah. Uh, but we come to an important point, uh, uh, Amanda, and uh, that um, the uh, Stone Age to Corinium uh, display, whatever we like to call it, it's not just a display of the taxonomy and the chronology uh, of prehistory. It's also access to examining for people to uh, interpret to interrogate, shall I say, the process of archaeology itself. Do you want to say a bit more about that? Yeah. Because I know it's something quite close it to your is heart. Close to my heart. <laughs> and you know, I was delighted when when you <laughs> saw images of the galleries and you picked it up. And I was so thrilled because to get that across and you to realise <laughs> that's the point. I, I was I was really, really pleased. Um, because I think for me, because I've worked in education and, and um, also, you know, in archaeology, um, I sometimes feel that people don't necessarily understand or make the connection between objects they see on display and the whole process that object has been through to get to be on display. And the lifetime of an object, I mean, you think some of those objects haven't seen the light today for 25 years, um, but also to what happened to it prior to it even getting to that stage is quite remarkable. Um, but I think it's really important that you show that that process of actually something is excavated, it's discovered, yeah. um, and then it's it's probably in bits when it's discovered, you know. So somebody then has to piece it back together as best they can. Then there are people that might um, do research on an object, so take analysis of an object, um, and that might tell us something else about the object. Um, and, you know, it has to be processed. Once, once it arrives at the museum, it goes through this processing and, um, and then eventually it will end up on display. But it ends up on display in a way that we choose to display it as well. You know, it's, yeah. it's within a, a, a theme, it's within a story. Yes. Um, and yep. it could be part of many stories, but it's in the story that we yeah. decide to tell. So if you take it yeah. out of that context, for example, then yeah. its meaning changes completely. Yeah. So, Ab absolutely. Yeah, so there's many ways that, yeah. And getting and across say, many that, that, that uh, the archeology span is not necessarily about the objects, it's not about the bling, but it's about the context itself, because without the context, you can't tell any story. And that's eventually what yeah. archeology span is all, all about, being able to, uh, give a narrative, yeah. give a, a, a story that, uh, um, you know, is illuminating yeah. and uh, inspiring. Absolutely. That wasn't a question, but... No. <laughs> one, of my, one of my famous non-questions, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> it's, okay. yeah, it's all right. Uh, listen, you've, you've touched on this a couple of times, but... Um, but there's a lot more to say about it. Uh, I think one thing that, apart from the fact that the museum is just so spectacular now, um, and it'll be lovely to be able to show people uh, some of those um, aspects in this, but, um, but education as well, and not just education, but the way you've, uh, you've, you've actually opened it up in a, in a, a much more communal way you know you've got different aspects of uh, of the local community that can engage with the museum uh, now but uh, educationally the amount of children of all ages that um, uh, that you're getting involved mm -hmm. you know it's it, we've said this in, in, in other in places that you know that, that there there is nothing more important than inspiring children 
and it, it's something that you've you've put a lot of effort into making that happen so you know tell us a little bit more about uh, how the uh, the museum actually engages educationally um yeah so um in in that development stage of the project one of the things that you have to do is identify what audiences you're going to work with so i mean as a team we we sat down we did a lot of work into this and and looked at well we know we know who we reach we know who our audiences are that already engage with us well who aren't we reaching you know who's missing out because these are the people that we should try and engage with um and uh the prehistory galleries themselves opened up new opportunities so one of those um, was of course that the, the curriculum has changed again and now prehistory is taught on the school curriculum once again. Yes. About time to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, that gave us an opportunity to do a whole series of, of new workshops based on prehistory because it's all well and good suddenly changing the curriculum, but actually if schools aren't set up to 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 deal with this or the local museum doesn't offer anything then yeah. i know a lot of teachers mm. were sort of scratching their heads and saying well what 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 do we what do we do um mm. so that was a fantastic opportunity so we did a lot of work with local schools um and discussing the curriculum and and, and what we could offer um mm. so we have a range of things because we have workshops that can happen here in the museum mm. But we also have loans boxes that go out to schools and they use the artifacts themselves from the loans boxes. Oh, wow. Um, How exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Which are really popular and especially at the moment because we can't do any workshops in the museum. <laughs> um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so now we're having to develop a whole load of digital content as well so that we've got an alternative program <laughs> right. for schools whilst we're not doing <laughs> hands on delivery. Um, so schools was an important one. We also recognise, I mean, we're, we are a very well-known family museum, um, yeah. but within that we, we didn't feel like we catered for early years particularly. Um, mm -hmm. So we looked at, at ways of working with, with early years. So we worked with a number of groups in Sirencester um, to see the sorts of things that they would be interested in. So. We, we now have a storytelling program. We have, can you see on the wall behind me? Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, that's a tactile play mat, <gasps> which is one. a prehistoric oh. game. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say the same, yeah, I want one. Yeah. <laughs> Good uh, grief. So look at the little round houses and stone circle. Yeah, yeah. But this is for <sighs> under fives to oh engage with Lord. the prehistoric landscape. So we've got a, um, a, a reconstructed roundhouse in the galleries. And inside that we've, we've put um, like foam log cushions and, and different things that really young children can play with and interact. They absolutely love it. So it's been really successful. Yeah, things like yeah. musical well, instruments, things like that. Brilliant. Well, you can so, tell that Rupert and I have a numerical age and we have an actual age now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, as has been observed by numbers of people over the years. <laughs> uh, oh, I, are you able, uh, you know, with, with the strength of this exhibition and the museum and the redevelopment mm. of the museum, do you feel now uh, that your outreach is uh, wet beyond the own uh, your own the locality and uh, you can outreach more nationally perhaps in future i hope so <laughs> because i just yeah. <laughs> i I, I mean from the educational like, point of view yeah from the educational point of view yeah okay yeah. um yes um I do. I mean, we, we, we do cover quite a, a wide area in terms of education. Schools come from all over to, to visit us. Oh, right. yeah. We yeah. have yeah. won awards That's for our education, um, yeah. but, and we cover all ages. I mean, I focus there on, on early years, actually, but we cover hmm. secondary school, college. We've got, we, we, 
the college down the road, Sirencester College, used to offer the archaeology A level until they got rid of it, um, which is a whole other subject. Mm -hmm. But um, the yeah. the college do offer some heritage courses, so we work closely with them. And of course, we've got the Royal Agricultural University, which has recently started doing an archaeology degree. Um, oh, really? So, okay. but but we have un other universities visiting as well. So we we cover the whole. The whole range. It is amazing. Well, conscious of time, Amanda, uh, t uh, tell us what uh, what's next for you now. What you know, you, you so you you just recently you, so you've come to the end of this massive six year uh, project. You've opened the new galleries, which are yes. just breathtaking. What now? <laughs> um, first and foremost, I'm having a well earned holiday. Because yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had some really difficult moments where everyone went off on, on furlough and I was oh. literally the only person here finishing the project single-handedly. <laughs> so yes. um, I am exhausted, to be honest. But I think after, after having a, a break, um, of course, the project's not actually finished because we have the activity plan that runs now for a period of time where we have to deliver a number of programs um so we have to do that and and as one uh, rather nice funder pointed out to me when i sent them the invitation to the launch they got back to me and said oh that's wonderful that's great well we'll be expecting your final report then <laughs> now <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what you've been really looking forward to, yes. So I thought, oh, I don't even get a yeah. day. Now I'm going to start report writing to actually now. Yeah. <laughs> so there's lots of that to do. But I think um, it's a it's a moment for pause, isn't it? Yeah. To take yeah. A, yeah. a breath, yeah. enjoy the new galleries and really think about what what to do next. Well, what a fantastic uh, achievement. Mm. I, for one, am absolutely full of admiration. And, uh, absolutely. Uh, it, it's, it's remarkable what you have achieved. Mm. It truly is. And, and you, clearly, you were the person for the job because, <laughs> uh, you know, you've just, you've driven it. So uh, just with such clarity, yeah. uh, it's honestly, genuinely, uh, we are in awe. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, it is wonderful. And we very much look forward to being able to come to visit yeah. as well. Yeah. Is there anything when, you feel? Uh, when everything settles is there down? anything that you feel that we've we've missed out in this uh, conversation, which we've enjoyed so much listening to you as well? But is, is there anything you'd like to add uh, before we before we wrap up? Um, well, I, I just feel like um, I I haven't expressed enough how. Um, important some of these objects are and we really do have spectacular objects yeah, on display yeah. to see so you Good know point. it's it's really well worth it well we shall uh, we shall make sure that we give people all the uh, all the all the links for how they can uh, uh, you know find your uh, your website online and things like that uh, because, uh, yeah. yes, for the people who can't come to visit uh, readily, then it would be good for them to see uh, uh, some of the aspects that, that they will be missing if they don't come to visit. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it is. It's, and the, uh, the good uh, thing about not having a launch here in the, the museum is that we did the online launch. So if people are interested, then yeah. they can see all the new galleries through that and, and learn a bit more about the, the story behind yeah. it. Yeah. So do yeah, put that link yeah. on. Uh, we will share that. We will share that as well. Yeah. We will indeed. indeed. Yeah. Well, it's time to say bye-bye uh, and uh, say how much we've enjoyed the conversation. And uh, thank you so much once again uh, for joining us for this, uh, for this chat, uh, Amanda. Uh -huh. And uh, I, 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 my guess is that quite a few people listening to this will come away very inspired by not only your example, but uh, uh, you know the, the kinds of things that you have achieved and uh, and showing what's what's possible. Yeah. So um, um, thank you. Yeah. No. Honestly, uh, we are we are so grateful. You know, thank you so much for uh, for taking the time to talk with us because uh, you know, as I said, it, it's wonderful what you've achieved there and uh, and. The more people know about it and come to visit uh, the museum the better so uh, yeah thank oh, you thank, very, very thank much. you so much 
thank you for, for having me on. And I will say just one last thing briefly. During the first lockdown, when I was um, off and I had to, to go on furlough and the project had to pause, which was really difficult for three months, the one thing that kept me going was listening to you guys. So thank you very much. Oh, you're so sweet. Thank you so much. That is such a nice thing to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's lovely to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Thank you. viewers, for, for watching. Uh, we'll see you all yeah, very soon. Take, take good care. Bye.